Um, he zoomed into the living faith a number of times, so yep. most of you, are, <clears throat> excuse me, are familiar with him. Um, but we've also read uh, his one of his books, Faith Forming Faith, uh, with the staff of Upper Dublin. We read it about a year ago, and it's really what's behind our trying to um, reimagine the way we welcome people into the fellowship and community of this congregation, um, creating a more extensive process that really is forming people. Because one of the things we've learned is uh, younger people, especially of whom we have many coming to us, have little or no background in, in the church. And so they may have impressions of what it's like and what to expect, but they don't really know what we believe deeply and how we do what we do and why we do what we do. And so it's always great to have Paul here to talk about those things and to remind us of how everything we do is tied to baptism. I think that's enough. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, our, our time is so limited this morning. Um, my assignment, as I understand it, is to try to connect the dots between our uh, our baptismal calling as God's people and the really important work that we're called to right now um, for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, you know, this is a this is a university graduate level course to be taught, <laughs> not a 45 minute adult course. But I'm gonna I'm gonna do my best. And I I also always have the disclaimer when I talk about DEI work that um <laughs> I'm I'm the white straight guy in the room. Um so I'm part of the problem. <laughs> and um Really, the only qualification that I have beyond my ordination and my call as a child of God is um, it's been a great privilege uh, serving as a board member of the National Lutheran Choir over the past two or three years to initiate and be the first chairperson of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee for the National Lutheran Choir, which um, is um, Most of them don't know anything about yeah. the national. Well, the national. I was just going to say the National Lutheran Choir is um, has its home in Minneapolis, and it's an all white traditional Lutheran uh, classical choir. You you should know about them. Just just Google the National Lutheran Choir. They are fabulous, and there's tons of stuff online. Um, that they offer for free. And once you get hooked on them, you, you <laughs> won't ever stop. Um, but as an all white organization, um, they are really stepping forward and kind of leading the way. Um, they're trying to step forward and lead the way in uh, becoming a more um, inclusive and open uh, organization since they represent the, the Christian faith out there in, in the world. So um, I think for the last two weeks or so, um, uh, Dottie and um, Elizabeth have been <laughs> editing around this sermon that I preached um, this past um, January. I was in residence at Mount Olive Lutheran Church in Minneapolis as um, their lead pastor, while well, their pastor was on sabbatical. And uh, Mount Olive is uh, located on South Chicago Avenue, it is one mile north of George Floyd Square. Oh, yeah. um, so they were in the thick of it in the aftermath of um, George Floyd's murder. And um, I learned a lot by being with them as a congregation and hearing their stories and um, trying to listen deeply to the way they responded to uh, to that tragic murder and its aftermath and, and to the 
violence that erupted in their community and really threatened their their church. I mean, there was a time when they thought their church might be burned to the ground. Um, but because they had paid the rent uh, over the years in ministering to their community, when the post office and the McDonald's and other places were being looted and burned, the people of the community that they had served were standing outside in front of the church saying, leave this building alone. Wow. These are our friends. These are people who have cared for us through yeah. thick and thin. Were they white Lutherans? They were white Lutherans. Yep, <laughs> they were white Lutherans. Um, so they needed the voice of the black community um, to defend them. And um, they are not at all um, shy about their gratitude to how they were defended and cared for um, by the black community. At any rate, I preached this sermon on the baptism of our Lord. And if you go down about two thirds of the way um, in the page, there's a quote that most of the work that I'm gonna do with you today is, is based on. Um, it's a quote that comes um, from an ancient church um, historian and theologian whose name was Maximus of Turin. And um, he tries to answer the question, why did Jesus have to be baptized? Why would you take one who is without sin and, and baptize him? And um, Maximus of Turin has kind of responded to that question for all time in saying that it wasn't so that Jesus would be made holy by the water. It was so that all water by Jesus would be made whole. Mm. Would you say that again, please? Yes. It, it wasn't so that Jesus would be made holy by the water. It's that all water by Jesus would from now on be holy. So the water that watched over him in the Jordan went on to become the water that Honestly and truthfully, and I think if Brendan were here would tell us scientifically, <laughs> is the same water that comes out of our taps today. That water has flowed over Jesus at a, at a very molecular level. Something that I think our friend Maximus of Turin did not know or understand, but he got it theologically. And so this this sermon is really kind of just um, just kind of fleshes that out for you know what does that mean for us as um, as contemporary <laughs> Christians thinking about our baptism and thinking about how it um, how it affects uh, the decisions we make and the the work God has called us to do in our baptism. I'm not a very good artist, um, but this is supposed to be a doc. I drew the boats as a clue. <laughs> but, and yeah, those are supposed to be boats. <laughs> just in case that's difficult also to figure out. And I just I, I just want to kind of sketch this in your mind as a way to think about the anti-racism work that we are called to do. Uh, through our baptism into Christ. As well-meaning, um, grace-filled, baptized Lutherans, I think we do most of our anti-racism racism work up here on the top of the dock, okay? So what that work looks like is... Um, us saying things like, um, well, I have some friends who are black. <laughs> or in another uh, iteration of uh, equity work, I have some friends that are gay. I know a gay man. We have a gay couple that lives next door to us. Uh, I understand that you had an autistic person speak to you last week. I know a person who's autistic. 
Um, we might also say, well, I, you know, I, I'm very careful about my language. Um, I, I don't use the N word. Um, I refer I refer to people as black and brown. Um, I'm 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 woke about that. You know, I really I get it. <laughs> Um, th those are all things that are happening up here on the top of the dock, and they're they're good and they're important, and they're um, they're they're worthy of being repeated, and good for us for doing those things. But I want to go under the dock <laughs> today, a and I think it's not by accident that. Under the dock is where the water is. <laughs> and under the dock is the more serious issue that we're called to face of systemic racism. Now, what just in your mind, what's the difference between racism and systemic? racism and let's all just let's all just put our egos here in the middle of the room let's get our nobody's going to get their feelings hurt if you say something that that um other people disagree with we're all siblings in christ around this table so don't be afraid to like put it out there what's the difference between racism and systemic racism. Please. I would say that systemic racism is racism that's built in the system. I just watch something that I have to watch again on Prime Video. It was titled, well, I don't remember the title, but it was White Religion. And then it says something about racism. And it's not the first time I heard it, but race was created by white people, according to this movie. Mm -hmm. And I'm also reading, was reading a book a couple, several years ago called Cast. Mm -hmm. And they're saying that we really live in a caste system. Yes. But again, white people created race. And in this little one hour thing that I'm watching on that I watched and will rewatch. It talks about indentured servants and it also talks about enslaved people and Native Americans and how at one point, and I never heard this, it was a rebellion and it was the indentured servants and the enslaved, the black enslaved people. And once they rebelled, then they started making laws that these and servant people would have benefits because they their the skin color was white. And then it kept a division between people who were enslaved and indentured. And it talked about a whole lot of stuff, uh the church and how at one point enslaved people, free black people, white people worship together and then they decided to build balconies and wanted to separate people. So then a group of African-Americans or black people left and created AME churches and other churches. But this particular show, there were a lot of Lutheran churches from different areas. I believe it was a um, Hispanic Lutheran pastor. It was a Native American Lutheran pastor. It was a lot of pastors. There was some from New York and a lot of them from Mississippi, from um, Minneapolis. But it was interesting how they talked about different landmarks or um, points of history. And then they said, similar to what you're saying, now you got to go and read between the lines. And then they talked about- I drew lines on my <laughs> <laughs> So that's what I would say to systematic racism is it's baked in the DNA. I was just going to say baked in. Oh my gosh, you took the words right out of baked my mouth. Baked in the yes. DNA of this country. Yes, and baked in, I, I want to just 
I want to build on that analogy. When you bake a cake, you don't, when the, when the cake is baked, you don't say, well, this is sugar and this is flour mm -hmm. and this is vanilla and this is lemon and this is chocolate. You say, this is cake. So, so you see it as kind of this monolithic thing, right? It's, so what a big part of, of the work that we're called to do is to like take the problem of racism, take that baked cake of racism and parse it out <laughs> into its different ingredients so that we can wrap our heads around it. They mentioned the mountain pot and said, everybody's coming in the country into the mountain pot and it creates white. Um, which it does not. Here, here's an interesting statistic for you. Um, we are now at the point where every year we rise one grade level of um, white students being in the minority in our public schools. When I think I say, right I think right now we're at like third grade. When I say white, I'm talking about culturally. Yeah. Yes. yes. Yeah. Not yeah. not white people, yeah. but the mountain pot you come yeah. in yeah. and you melt and you're no longer your own separate identity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh uh, we white people love the melting pot as long as it was melting our yeah. way. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But one of the issues is <clears throat> that what does white mean even in that in that determination? Because you know now um, there's so many people who are multiracial that using the term racial terms it becomes less and less meaningful, and um, it's it's like you know, I look at it in my own family. You know, it, it, one of my cousins, you know, for her to describe. She she doesn't want to answer the question what her race is. You know, her her father was black, her mother is white. What are her children? You know, I mean, it's like they get to decide. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it, yeah. Does anybody else want to get their oar in the water about what systemic racism is or what the difference is between the two? Got it. Just one little example, which I learned a few years back, redlining. Uh, it's invisible, but it makes it very difficult uh, to succeed as a Black person. That is keeping Black people out of certain communities. Realtors work together. And Baked in this. the system. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yes. And there's a multiplicity of things like that that exist that, in fairness, many people of us around this table are not aware of, but nonetheless, it goes on. It, and the, the tragedy is it's invisible. But some of it is visible. Yeah, like that's the fact, true. Visible to us. The fact that yeah. black veterans were excluded oh from my gosh, the yes. veterans' benefits. Yes. yes. You know, after yeah. the war. I mean, and and just, even segregated into units. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it's like suppressing voting all over the place. I mean, redistricting places so black Very people yeah. cannot Andrew. get their yeah. vote in. Yeah. yeah. Please. Yeah. And some is as fundamental as just the exams that are given to students. Um, who don't even have a clue on the terms being used, oh, yeah. the SAT types yeah. of exams mm -hmm. to advance yes. and move yes. on. They're not equitable right. for all races. Baked in the system. Right? Yeah. In the yeah. system. So now, now we're under the dock. Now <laughs> we're talking about stuff that's down here. And again, that's where the water is. <laughs> uh, so I think that makes it even a more poignant baptismal calling for us because we're called to be where the water is, right? As, as people, that's where change, that's where passages get made. To go back to yesterday's work, if you were here yesterday, we talked about um, how the passage through the Red Sea, um, it, it, that's where the roots of Easter actually are. The passage from, um, from um, slavery to freedom ends up being culminated in the cross where uh, Christ makes the passage from death to life um what what does the Libby, Libby has. Mm -hmm. go ahead oh I was just going to say I think that um as a person who was a late person growing up that's where the murky water is mm -hmm. it's not just clean water it's it's murky water it's where the algae grows and it's where 
And, and uh, I mean, it's, it's muddy, it's yucky. And yeah. and so, uh, and that's, it's, messy. it's yes. very messy. And yeah, so for us, uh, for me personally, um, systemic racism is, is a, a set of systems that have actually benefited me. And to Dottie's point, I didn't even know about them till we did the anti-racism seminars here at church. So uh, not that's not an excuse, but I'm just no. saying it's awful. We haven't, we it's haven't. It's not part of our history. Yeah, we haven't done our we work share. and we, and we yeah. don't know our history. Who can tell me why the year 1493 is important? 93, not 92. Right. <laughs> That's his point. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. What happened in 1493? They're connected. Does that have to do with land? Where? Slavery. Prince Henry of Portugal uh, was big time in the slave market. Um, yeah, you're you're all sort of <laughs> dancing around it. Columbus went back to, um, to Spain and said, um, I'll go back. Um, but but I want to know what the parameters are. Mm -hmm. I want to know like what I can and can't do in this new land that God has given us white people. And so uh, Ferdinand and Isabella went to the Pope. Mm -hmm. um, and the Pope at the time, Alexander, I believe Alexander the sixth, uh, the Pope was the closest thing we had in 14 in the late 15th century to a world court a world court didn't exist so the pope had kind of the ultimate authority and ultimate say in what would happen and he answered this um question by writing a doctrine called the doctrine of discovery that's wow. what I couldn't remember the title <laughs> when I said land, and that's what I learned yesterday. Yes. The discovery, yeah, the, and the document of discovery. The doctrine of discovery pretty much said to white European people, it is now get this, this is profound. It is your God-given right and calling to go to this new land and take it over and kill anybody that you need to in order to get this land, to conquer this land. And, um, you know, if you happen to Christianize some of them along the way, that's, that nice. that's a good idea. But you are entitled. It is your God-given right to the land, to the people, to do whatever you want because this is this is the manifest destiny to which we are called as white European people. There is an important new book. I think it was just released on the 22nd of September. And I wish I could remember the author. Maybe Google, do you have your iPad? Maybe you can Google this for me and Keith. I, it, I remember it by the acronym throws, the hidden roots of white uh, supremacy. It's, it's, it is like cast and um, um, how the word is passed and um, uh, how to be an anti-racist on steroids. <laughs> Robert, Robert Jones. Robert Jones, mm -hmm. the roots of the hidden roots of white supremacy. It, please buy it today. I, I think it's more important to buy that book than it is to buy my book. That's how good it is. <laughs> uh, that's quite a statement. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the hidden roots of white supremacy. But he he is the one who really like strips um strips the veneer off the doctrine of discovery and, and puts it right out there. But that was sort of the ultimate putting the cake in the oven to keep that analogy going. And it's still in force. So the ELCA just rejected it like last year, the year really? before, in the last two or three years. Oh my. But the Vatican is not. I, I think now the Vatican have repeated, has. Have it, within like with the last year. A couple of years. Yes. Right. And here's what the precipitating incident is, if I'm remembering this correctly. Uh, uh, Pope Francis came to Canada and was confronted about the uh, mistreatment of the indigenous people and was caught kind of flat-footed. Actually, Jones talks about this um, in, in his book. And he went back and got himself more fully educated about the doctrine of discovery and it has 
since been repudiated. Yeah. This is just, sorry. But this is 2023. We just got around to it. Uh, I, we went to Seville on my sabbatical in 2019, and we went to the cathedral there. That's where Christopher Columbus is buried, and, uh, and his whole family is buried in the cathedral in Seville. And the thing that you come away with that is this guy made everybody a lot of money. <laughs> that is overwhelming because the the tomb is incredible. Like it's 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 on the shoulders of like the four areas of Spain you know, that they're embodied, and it's like this massive thing in all his family. And it's but the feeling you get is like this guy made a lot of people rich. Yeah, <laughs> and that's why he's here. Yeah. So so we have a, a, a and we've we put them out on the table. We have a couple of pretty important like turning points in our white history. Um, so the, the invention of racism to begin with, and I should know the date about that, but I can't, I just can't pull it up right now. It's fairly recent. Yes, it is. And then we have 1493, the Doctrine of Discovery, and then we have 1619 and the 1619 Project. Actually, Jones was like, you know, that there has to have been something that made the six that made 1619 possible. So his one of his tags lines is yes, 1619, and also, <laughs> and then he got back to 1493, which is really, really important. And Libby, to your point, yes. These are not the clear kind of waters that we baptize our babies in today, right? <laughs> these are murky, muddy crap filled algae infested waters that we now are called to work through um now i want to introduce you to another can, can i just finish this point um i, I want to introduce you to another guy who's who's doing some of the hard work down here his name is ibram x kendi oh, oh, yeah. How to be an anti-racist. Yeah. And this, if you if you don't take anything else home from today, please take this. His most pithy uh, instruction to us white people in that book is, if you are not systemic, systemically working on a daily basis to dismantle um, the pillars of racism that are in our culture, you are part of the problem. Amen. In other words, it's like pumping water uphill. You, you can't be neutral about this because neutrality keeps the cake bacon it doesn't do anything to tear that cake apart into its component pieces so that we can begin to dismantle that that was probably as a relatively wealthy white straight guy <laughs> that was probably the biggest turning point in my life now, I'm not saying that I'm doing that or that I'm doing it well. I'm I'm endeavoring to wade into those waters and get more educated about what it means to dismantle the systems that I and people like me have incredibly benefited from throughout my lifetime. Timber, you were going to make a point. Yes, before I make that point, what you're just saying is, I think for people in general, that sounds like a tall order because Dottie was saying she just learned about redlining not too long ago. So that means that all the white people that are in their little communities, maybe without people of color that are going about their lives, they may not even be aware of some of those undercurrent situations to start working on them. Now, the point I was going to make before was in the little movie in the movie that I watched, there was an enslaved 
lady with her child and she fought and won for her freedom because at that particular time, before they changed the law, and I don't know what law it was, she argued to the courts that it was stated that a baptized Christian couldn't be enslaved. And so she was able to win her case, she was gained her freedom. Yeah. But he, then after that, even if they baptized enslaved people, they didn't free them. Yeah. Um, going back to your earlier point about us not knowing about redlining or really understanding how it worked. There are a million molecules of water floating around down here that are situations like that. Like it, 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 it is embarrassing to me that as a 67 year old white man, I've just come to know and understand what the doctrine of discovery is within the last year. I just learned yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the commitment that is demonstrated in this room just by you being here. The commitment to continue to learn and to grow mm -hmm. is I think what Christ is, is calling us to. And, um, you know, from St. Paul himself, um, don't flag in zeal, like mm -hmm. <laughs> do not grow weary in well-doing, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it is an uphill slog. It is like pumping water uphill. If 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 you're not continually pumping it uphill, it's gonna it's gonna come back downhill. And that's that's the point that Candy is making um making in his book. Please. I can make one statement to that. Um here we all sit and now we know this. And I will say, shame on us if we choose to continue to ignore or pretend that we don't know and that let somebody else worry about it, then we are part of the problem. Well, we are part of the yes, problem. Yes, absolutely. So that needs to be repeated yes. and repeated and repeated. Yes. I'm sorry, and but it does. I'm, I'm not big on shame, so. No. Well, I just shame. <laughs> <laughs> so, shame on us, no, I, I think. Is, okay, it's a phrase, but it, it's pitiful. It is I think shame on us is appropriate. But also <laughs> grace on us. Yeah, yeah. Um, my wife's school in Seattle is um, a school that has really adopted um, an, uh, an anti-racism uh, stance as an elementary school. And one of their mantras is, when we know better, we do better. Mm -hmm. When we know better, we do better. So now we all know. You, 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 I guess you can say, well, I was asleep when Hoffman was talking about the doctrine of discovery. I'm not really sure what he said, but we all know now about the doctrine of discovery. And um, I, I think it's important for us to spread that word and to think about what that means and to think about what reparations look like. Um, this is a little bit of a rabbit hole to go down, but I'm I'm going to go down it um, because of the incredible um, history of Native Americans in in Western Washington. We are really really big in Western Washington on land acknowledgments, and the Native Americans are like just shut up, <laughs> like that is. That's that is real helpful to make you feel good. We want the land. We don't want the acknowledgement. We want the land. And I wasn't at this lecture, but I heard about a lecture at which somebody was a white person was talking about the importance of um, land acknowledgements. And there was a very um, cheeky Native American in the group. And while this person was talking, he went up to the podium and took the guy's laptop <laughs> and started walking away with it and said, I want to acknowledge that this laptop belongs to our <laughs> It was a really, really bold thing to do in a public assembly, but nobody that was in that room will ever forget. Uh -huh. right? Um, so, you know, land acknowledgements were a 
an important step in the process, but we're not done. <laughs> you know, that wasn't the end of the process. That was a step along the way in the process. Uh, I, I want to mention a few books for those of you who are readers. Some of them we've all, all already thrown out. The Hidden Roots of White Supremacy. I haven't read it yet. I've just heard a podcast where uh, Jones was interviewed. I think it's a really important book. How the Word is Passed, which uh, was written by a Black man who visited 10 different prisons in the South and uh, used the... Um, the uh, experience of seeing those facilities to make 10 different points across the course of his book. Um, you know the author? I don't know the author, but- you Would know. you be so kind as to send me uh, a somewhat bibliography yeah. that yeah. I can then yeah. share? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. the ignorance yeah. yeah. of white supremacy, how the word is passed, how to be an anti-racist, cast, those would probably be up in my top four. You know, one of the things that um, uh, is talked about in um, <laughs> how the word is passed and and how how skilled we are as white people in blocking things out. He tells the story about how in the slavery plantations, in some cases, um, there were um, places where what the white landowner deemed to be attractive Black women were separated. Mm -hmm. And those became uh, brothels. And the rich white landowners would take advantage of those women and what they never understood was that the ch children born out of those illicit affairs, their own children then became enslaved. That's how insidious this problem is. I mean, you want to talk about algae filled murky water. That's, you know, if 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 we who are the people in power can block things out like that, there's still a lot of unraveling. And sometimes those children may have became slaves to the master's children of his white wife. Or they were house slaves. The siblings. Because in a skin the color, yeah. The, yeah. Color. Yeah. the lighter you were, the closer you got to the to the plantation house. Yeah. Yeah. Because we are Lutheran Christians and we share a baptismal inheritance of grace, I think <coughs> the least hopeful response to all of this is guilt. Because guilt is the gift that keeps on giving. Yeah. Right? Remember when we were, when most of us in this room were kids and, and Kodak was advertising their cameras and it was this beautiful little scene on Christmas morning under the tree and the Kodak's picture was taken was that Kodak moment, the gift that keeps on giving. Well, that's what guilt is. But it, and guilt leads to denial. And guilt then leads, yes, it leads to all sorts of things. We are inheritors of a baptismal theology. The water has run over Jesus, the water of grace and forgiveness. It's also water that calls us, as Paul says in Romans 6, to be committed to lives of righteousness. Mm -hmm. Romans 6 is so powerful is. in terms of um, our baptismal theology. Um, but it, it is, it is. I, I hope that anything that we've done here today doesn't send you out the door 
feeling nothing more than guilt. <laughs> um, it's meant to make you feel or to help you feel empowered. Exactly. When you, when we know better, we do better. Do better. Yeah. yeah. I think I better lay it down there because um because you're gonna preach. Because <laughs> I'm involved in the second service. Romans six. Thank you. On a personal level, what you did today is such a gift to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm just because of my own history and my own life. Um, you have given me the desire not to give up. <laughs> yeah, please don't, yeah. don't give up. Yeah. yeah. Um, there are two books of mine. If you're interested, they're here. Dottie can help you yeah. get your hands on them. Easy um, read, beautiful read, 20 bucks. Yeah. They're just thank gorgeous. Yeah. I don't think I'll ever run water again without thinking about it. No. Oh my gosh, that's the, that's yeah. the nicest yeah. thing you could say. Yeah, it's yeah. beautiful. That's yeah. 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 Thank All right, you. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, so thank you both. I'm going to send it out if you can, and then yeah, yeah, to see who you know whoever oh, wants to, to, to do it. Oh, I didn't bring my camera. Do you want to send it down? I'll send it here. This I'm yeah. Dottie, uh, and you know Albert Dotty. Oh, it's Dottie brings Bible study. Um, it's it's a German Christmas fairs. Hmm. Um, well, talk about being immersed with a bunch of white people. Tina <laughs> Marie, you gotta come with us. Okay. Yeah. Oh, 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 Where is it? When? And I'm just. You know what? Claire's got the postcard. Um, it's Christmas. 